We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Hey team, well, welcome back to another episode here of the MindMate podcast. I'm really pumped about this one and um, I think for a lot of us, um, at least in what you guys have been talking about creativity has been this, this big thing that we're all exploring at the moment. And um, it's such a fantastic way to turn pain into purpose and everything. And my guest today um, doesn't actually need a really an introduction for you guys, but I think is a brilliant example of what creativity can do in this day and age, not in terms of, not only in terms of business, but um, in terms of just finding our own path. And um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to, to speak with you today, East. Thanks. Thank you. Happy, uh, happy chat. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, so for those that don't know you, um, would you like to give us just a brief introduction of kind of who you are and um, how you became who you are today? Well, uh, who I am is I have a project called East Forest, which sometimes is my identity, I suppose, as well, but <laughs> it was never intended that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm and I'm really interested in making tools primarily through music and experiences that take us into the inner landscape. And a lot of that's recorded music, live performances, uh, retreats, my own podcast, um, talks and so forth, workshops. So it's just, I, I'm just kind of like I had my own discovery process of kind of unveiling how that, the, infinite depth of those experiences a lot through initially with psychedelic uh, experiences that woke me up to that kind of being the only game in town. Mm. And then I just, I'm, I'm just really fascinated and interested in diving back in there continually because this doesn't seem like there's much else to do. <laughs> That's so, so true. Um, yeah. I do that a lot through music. It's just kind of part of the, the base of my tree of things. Mm. Yeah. So I suppose that's a really good area to begin with. Do you feel that your, um, your ability to express yourself was always going to be through music? Were you always playing music as a child? Because obviously it's writing for some people, dancing for others, knitting, I don't know. But yeah, was music your thing? I've always played music and was into music. Uh, in school, in public schools, it was like through choir mostly and mm. actually like acting and musical theater those were the things sort of on the table and band i played in the band there um but i didn't get into like writing my own music until college mm. and then it really took off because it was really fun for me and before that i really really enjoyed it but i essentially like performing other people's music so the thing that i was always into looking back i would say was i was I was kind of like an extroverted introvert. Like I liked to perform in all these different ways, uh, whether it was even acting or, or singing or whatever, or just being a class clown. <laughs> and then as I grew up, I think that translated into like, I, I enjoy performing essentially. You know, I enjoy like having people watch me, <laughs> they have yeah. like their eyes on me. And I'll, I admit that it's like, but that also feeds then my interest in saying like, well, let's, let's go out there and perform it. Let's, let's offer this publicly. Otherwise maybe I just maybe make it and not release it or, you know, yeah. not, not because it is a very strange thing to get up there and feel nervous and just keep doing that. And on one level, not enjoy it, but on another level, it's very satisfying. It's like overcoming a challenge every time. Um, it's really scary even after all these years, but you keep doing it. It's like, it's kind of, it's kind of like base jumping or something, you know, but it's potential public humiliation. <laughs> so he's Dude, keep it's so it. true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is. A, when you, when you start thinking about the, um, you know, psychology of the things that we do, 
you can start to almost go down a rabbit hole. You're like, what the hell am I doing? Like that is such a bizarre thing that I'm doing. But then at the same time, you know, overcoming a challenge and, you know, it sounds like, you know, at least in your experience, you find a lot of meaning through doing that. And um, I can imagine as well that when you start performing, because obviously you're in band and there's other people around you as well, you can kind of hide it within the band. But when you start doing your own, your own solo thing, almost in a way, because it's more challenging, um, it's also potentially or proportionally more meaningful because if you do a really great job, it's all on you. Um, did you find that in your own experience? I mean, I definitely, I don't know about what you think, but it's kind of like all the things that happen in your life are the perfect recipe for where you are in this moment. And I used to be in bands and I had a band that I was the band leader of. It's my music and so forth. But there were four of us in the band. And for four or five years, I was pushing that really hard. This is in my 20s. And it didn't really get where I wanted to get. And it, it fell apart because of band dynamics like mm -hmm. the drummer and the bass player being alcoholics and so sort of like personal dynamics mm -hmm. and how it fell apart because of that and that was really frustrating to me because I was putting all my money and time and interest in this thing and I'm like it's failing in some level I, I thought it was because of them but it's also part of the music <laughs> uh, but that's then I when I when this new thing started to emerge, this whole East Force thing, and it wasn't, I, I didn't intend it to be a commercialized project in any way. I, I did intend it to be a solo project because it's like, I don't want it to fall apart because someone else, no one's ever going to love it as much as I do. It's never going to be as important to them as it is to me. So I just designed it as like, well, then I just won't make the kind of music that requires a live drummer or a live bass player. I'll just like, that's why I started looping too, because I was doing these ceremonies and I was like, well, how do I, I mean, how do I do it myself? I need like the loop or something to create bigger sounds and more complex layers. So that's where it came from the intention. But I, um, I, I miss, you know, I really miss the magic that happens uh, when you're performing live with other people. I still do it in the studio. Um, and that I actually just recorded a live drummer, gents Karras, here in the studio a couple of weeks ago and it was a blast you know mm. but and it brings such a level of musicality to bring in other musicians which i do a lot in the studio but i don't do it as much live and i'd like to do that actually more in the future but it's just it's just marriage of me being a bit of a control freak so <laughs> being a solo project's good for that but also um you're right it there's no one to lean on and that's really difficult like even when you're in a play or something, if there's a couple people on stage, there's always this part of your brain that says like, well, maybe the audience is watching the other person or not. Everyone's yeah. looking at me right now because some people are watching other characters. Whereas when you're shooting a film and you're an actor and the camera's on you, there's one viewer <laughs> yeah, that's so it. hyper aware. It's like the camera is on me filming right now. And when you're a solar performer, it's kind of like that. It's like, there's nowhere else for people to, to look. Mm. But I, I like performing my ceremony concerts a lot because people are doing like an inner journey a lot of the time. Some people are lying down and it kind of gives me more freedom because I'm like, well, I'm not the main show. I'm supporting their viewing internally. And it actually gives me a lot of freedom because I don't feel self-conscious because I'm like, I really feel like I'm like creating a soundtrack for their internal experience as opposed to like people just standing there with their arms crossed. Like, yeah which I have to do that too. Yes. But it's a different, it's a different, like you have that performer mindset a bit more. Yeah. Well, so that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you about because, um, you know, like I said, I've been following you for about three years now and um, you're one of the only people out there, at least as far as I'm aware, that's actually creating this. I suppose it's not really a genre of music, but it's, it's music for people that are take that are having these inward experiences. And um the first thought that came to my mind was a very cool. Um, I need to start getting on these, on these, on these albums so I can do my own um, work and, and everything in that regard. But also, do you feel, do you feel like there's more writing on that to make sure that people have a successful experience or how do you kind of compartmentalize, you know, you creating your own thing that's, your flow state and you're loving it and it's your creativity with, with also wanting to, you know, do a, a good job so that people have 
um, successful inward experiences, if that makes any sense. Mm. I would say the stakes are higher only because you're dancing in the world where you're really not controlling a lot of things, especially when people might be deciding to take certain substances or not that I don't have any control over. And I'm not necessarily overtly inviting that, but I recognize that people do what they do. Mm. So I just, I'm trying from a harm reduction point of view, not create circumstances or like false expectations where they might be stepping into a situation that could get them into a little bit of trouble where I don't have the structure or the ability to support them in a way that maybe they would in a private setting uh, with like with a facilitator or something. So that is definitely a, an edge of the work that I'm very cognizant of because I, I just essentially am trying to not, I don't want people to have any trauma in their lives. I want to just create insight and positivity and I, it's okay to have, you know, challenging feelings, but that's very different than um, something that could feel traumatic to them, which that's not my intention at all. So I mean, I, I do my best to design that into the events with our language and with the promoters and, and so forth. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't so much in terms of like a, you know, harm reduction perspective, but more, um, you know, I, I always thought that, so I work as a, I work as a counselor and I'm so interested in people. That's why I love podcasting. Um, I've always been fascinated by people and, you know, that whole understanding of you're, you're in a body over there, <laughs> you know, and we're talking and I'm in a body here. And I'm like, I just can't get over the fact I've got fingers and, and one of these days I'm not going to be here. The whole thing is bloody fascinating to me, you know, so I've always been trying to understand other people's perspectives and things. And, um, you know, when you're creating music that's coming from your heart and everything, and people are responding in such a way, it's, um, there's so much responsibility, but I think that would also, you know, be something that Jordan Peterson talks about is, um, be so meaningful for you that so much is riding on you. Mm -hmm. But then as you were talking, I was kind of thinking, well, so long as what you're doing is coming from your heart, people are going to have a fantastic experience anyway, because one of the best things about watching musicians is, when they're not even there, they're just like an antenna and whatever's mm. working through them is coming through them. And, you know, you, you must've had these experiences before when you're creating music and it's just, you're not even in your body anymore. Something is just working through you like that, you know, which yeah. is so wonderful to watch. Yeah. Okay. Well that it requires that the audience is wanting to be there and opening their hearts. Mm. And so if you have like a hard ticket show where people paid to see you, hopefully what's awesome about that is they want to see you do your thing. So they're very like supportive. Whereas I kind of hate, I hate a strong word. I have a really hard time doing shows more recently where I, it's people who are sort of bought in. Yes. And because I, I, frankly, I'm like, if you don't want to be here, please leave. Like yeah. it makes it way easier for me to do what I do. I need, it's kind of like, I need to buy in from the totally. audience. The more they give me their attention, the more I can use that as a fuel to do what you're saying, like really dive into that uh, flow state. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't we bring it back to um, a bit more of your, your journey. So you were playing in bands and then you started moving towards, you know, what has become East Forest. So take us through the beginning of that journey. Was there, were there psychedelic assisted um, experiences for you? That certainly was a, a massive um thing for me in my life and um how did that start to open you up into creating music for you know inward journeys i'd had experiences over the years that um where music and a uh, psilocybin had aligned just a handful of them that were extremely meaningful and i didn't understand what they were but they were really really powerful and i think i wanted to create music that i could use to hopefully reverse engineer that and that's why I started creating some stuff for myself. And I made an album. My first album was just for that. It was for me to journey to. And I had an incredibly powerful experience journeying to that. That really changed my life and started everything from there. And then I gave that album to someone I just met, a new friend, and he got really obsessed with it. And he started setting up groups for me to play live. And we just essentially used the album 
uh, in these small private circles with psilocybin. And because the album's only 40 some minutes, I would like, well, I need to create some music around this. And so I started playing live with it a little bit. And then he just kept doing it, kept setting these things up. And I kept showing up and we kept sort of building a protocol mm. and building a musical language. And eventually we stopped using the album and I just would play. And, and we did that for many years. And, you know, I mean, 10 years into that in 2018, um, we were doing a, a group and he ended up founding a, a church with a, with the IRS, uh, an official church to kind of give it some um, framework. Um, not any religious framework, just sort of a uh, spiritual uh, concrete, whatever. Arifa, it's called the protections. And I recorded the music for Mushrooms album, which we had been doing this for many years. I just had never really said overtly, publicly what it was. And I just thought it was time. Mm-hmm. And so that was a five hour album, but it was really just a recording of me improvising in this these ceremonies for the weekend with this small group. And, uh, since then that, you know, that was the same year I was working with Ram Dass. And so since then it really just, um, there's also a meeting of the moment culturally, like uh, there's, there's much more interest in psychedelic therapy. And I think that's somewhat of an indication of all the changes going on in the world. People are looking for uh, meaningful tools and that's, that's a pretty powerful one for some people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that makes you so successful, you know, is because music is loved by all people, even people that hate the world love aggressive music, you know, so there's, there's always like a, a, a place for music, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, you can imagine the, the most nihilistic, like punk rockers or the heavy metal fans, I listen to anything, but um, people that hate anything, even they can get down to some aggressive screamo, or whatever. Yeah, everybody it is. has their music flavor. It's yeah. funny. Uh, it's so interesting. Like everyone likes, pretty much everyone likes music, but it's just like what kind they're into at the yeah. moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Which I think is so cool because um, it's expressing something for everyone. And I think, um, you know, you, you've touched on a on on something that is now, thank God, you know, gaining traction. Um, but you, you've always done it in a way to, you know, um, help. And you know, I think that's one of the, what's really helped psychedelics in in the you know the modern day Renaissance is you know we're we're trying to view these these things as tools and as ways to help and, and therapies. And if there are things, other things that can support that, like music, then. Um, it's going to really help some of the more conservative opinions kind of, you know, move, move beyond what we saw in the sixties. So I think that's a really good point. And the, the other one that I, that came to me as you were talking there is you must have a very interesting take on what music is actually really doing, especially when people are taking inward journeys to it. Has, 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 have any of your experiences or your insights given you a deeper understanding of, of what music is actually doing? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, music is, is amazing because it is mysterious and so multidimensional and infinite and all these different patterns and shapes you put together and it creates what we know as music. And it's, it's, inc- you know, it's 12 notes on a scale of a piano, but that's like every song you've ever heard. I mean, mm-hmm. it's amazing the kind of patterns you can put together and the emotions that it, it enlivens in us. So I actually started, uh, a new project called journey space. It's a platform where I'm creating um, a music library to use for clinicians and individuals to use for guiding journeys where you just kind of hit play and it takes you from start to finish. And that's an expanding library of music and journey space also then can do online facilitation where um, for people it's more accessible for people to perhaps have someone virtually guiding them through a journey. And journeys take a lot of different shapes and sizes, but I think music is a big hole that we're not fully um, under. Well, I don't know if understanding is the right word, but we're not recognizing its role in guiding a ceremony, guiding a journey, because uh, certainly traditionally uh, across cultures for many thousands of years, that was the main way we were going through ceremony. And I think there's no reason not to use that today. And frankly, we, it's proven its effectiveness in my own experience and working with other people, just how big of a shift positively it can make to have the right kind of music guiding someone through 
and experience. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, oftentimes it can be the difference between a wonderful experience and a very challenging experience, you know, just by the things that we're hearing. And I think you made a really great point, with, you know, any experience um, from, you know, the most primitive times to now has usually had some kind of sound aspect. You know, we've always been dancing to drums and, and things like that. But, um, you know, it's another step to then take that and go, why like why the hell are we doing this you know and i've never really understood that (laughs) i think it's i think it's baked into who we are you know i mean the first uh sense that we have in the womb is the ear the hearing that develops so the very first thing you're aware of is the heartbeat of your mother I mean, that's probably why we like four on the floor dance beats and beats in general. I mean, it's it's who it's it's the first thing we knew. We were we were not just that we were we were literally swimming in this ocean of pulsation that never mm-hmm. stopped, and that maybe we even like would and we would make that in our heads be the life source itself. It's the great mother, you know, the original rhythm that just was always there. It wasn't annoying. It wasn't bad or good. It just was. And there wasn't even light. We couldn't even see anyway at that point until our eyes develop later. Um, so it's almost like <laughs> literally we were the fish and that's the water. And you're trying to ask a fish what water is. Yes. That's what yeah. sound is to us. It's And it's baked into our stories about creation. You know, God spoke or even our scientific stories, the Big Bang. Um, and so it's much bigger than I think we know it is. And it's almost, it's kind of funny. It's that it's hard for us to see it because it's, it's everywhere. And we probably aren't even understanding fully how it works with our, our, our bodies on a psycho spiritual way. But we certainly can recognize that music is, is a big thing right now. It's the biggest thing it's ever been for human beings. I mean, with our ability to stream music in any song you want, essentially from the history of the, the canon of humanity, that's new. And yeah, we'd already yeah. take that for granted. <laughs> and we, and on top of that, because of that and earbuds and stuff, people are listening to more music they've ever listened to ever mm-hmm. all over the world. And again, we don't really stop and be like, is that, is that mean anything? It's yeah. like, it's, we, it's definitely happening. Uh, so you know, you get metaphysical about it. Perhaps it's the great song of creation that says the chorus is getting bigger and more complex and louder. Uh, we're singing one another awake, I would hope. But um, that's why I like bringing that kind of intentionality into the music and using, I'm, I'm interested in like, how can we use music as a tool for particular purposes? And for me, it's it's for inner insight, but it can be used in many different ways. Mm. Yeah, and and it always has like any, any kind of good song or what we all, you know, because creativity is such a subjective thing and yet wonderful creativity is objectively perceived as wonderful, you know, and, um, you know, Picasso or um, Mozart and, you know, we all, we, we all have a general, at least if it's not our own thing, we can all appreciate that is wonderful for some bizarre reason, which I'm trying to get to the bottom to now, I suppose. But um, what's interesting to me is, you know, a song is usually made up of a series of patterns of, you know, there's a verse and then there's a chorus and, you know, there's like a, a grounded thing that never changes, but then the verses go off in all different sorts of directions and kind of looks like a tree in my opinion, where you've got like the, the base that never changes, but the branches go off in all sorts of, you know, different sorts of directions. And I wonder how, how often that pattern, you know, if it's yin and yang, um, is, is, is around us all the time, you know, and it maybe, may, maybe that's feeding into something that's very deep within us and, and our evolution or something. Well, as far as trees, that's, it's a fractal pattern and that is around us all the time. It's, it's, it's in our own bodies and it's in pretty much everything else that's made from nature. And so that's why when we're in nature, it's soothing. I think we're seeing our reflection of who we are. Um, yeah, music, man, it's just it's just cool because of all the different shapes and sizes, all the different ways you can manipulate it and just how powerful it is on an emotional level. 
I, I like to work from improvisation and work from like essentially chord structures and then working with melodies, like little lay motifs on top of that. And I'm mostly interested in the sonic landscape that I'm creating and like what feeling all those, when you put those parts together, what feeling is it creating? So, so you start adding a few layers and usually the chord structure gives you your main emotional content. And then there's these different textures, whether it's a vocal thing or piano lines or field recording. And eventually it kind of unlocks a certain, like where the light comes on, it's like, ah, there's like, that's a vibe. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely a vibe person. Like that's all I really care about. It's, I don't really, that's primary and everything else becomes secondary, like what you put on top of that. But if you have the right vibe and it's just sort of rolling, even in some kind of loop, it's mesmerizing. Um, And you start putting melody on top of this and some kind of structure. And it's amazing. It's a story then. And then it's really getting into narrative. Mm, mm. Yeah. Almost the very definition of a journey, you know, taking someone through it. And yeah, that's, that's really cool. So a lot of the, just to give you some context, a lot of the listeners um, are interested in, you know, tools that can help them with, with their own lives, creating feeling lives, overcoming anxiety and and things like that. It's kind of like a counseling perspective, you know, or a psychological perspective. And one of the things we do on the podcast is we're always trying to um, get people on who have found some way to have created meaning in their own lives. And I was hoping to kind of guide the conversation into that paradigm for you now. And I'm always very interested in the creative types because, you know, in this, in this, in this world we live in to have been able to fund a life doing what brings you that sense of flow and or or that vibe, as you say, is um, it's creative because, you know, it's um, you've got to do your own thing and then create a following. Otherwise you won't, have you know, any money to pay for things and stuff. So I was wondering if you could firstly tell us um, what, in what way music kind of fuels that, that creative or meaningful element for you and then um, how someone out there who's struggling to find meaning in their lives might be able to take some of the tools that you've, 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 you've adapted or adopted, um, not necessarily from a musical perspective, but there's something that might help them as well. Well, I think I hear two questions there. Two saying, questions. Like, um, what role does like the music and creativity play for me feeling meaning? And then how could someone else like translate that creatively or for like yeah, fiduciary? Yeah. Like, well, more, I think more creatively, I think um, whatever it is, because you can have a job, you know, and that can be fantastic. But I also sure. don't necessarily believe that a job has to be me for you can be with just a way to, you know, pay the bills and things like that. So creatively is kind of the thing that we're going for. Well, I, I think that is the main thing It's like the creative expression, whatever that is for you. And it can even be just free writing or it, it's so it's, it's all humans have can tap into being creative. That's the key. Um, and that's the thing I think that makes you feel really alive. So for myself, like creating music in any shape or form, whether it's just playing the piano or working on a song or, or rehearsing for a live show or doing those things is also like fueling me to feel purposeful just as a human. It's kind of like doing push-ups or something. There's always resistance to doing it. But once I do it, it feels like that everything has meaning now. Like there's been an expression of a really core kind of, human energy and that is creating like we are we are creative beings and we're always creating whether we like it or not you know um with every thought i'm creating so this is just more magnified higher level form of creation when you just make something out of nothing in a way that's beautiful like a song or a picture or free writing or anything like that so i think that's the thing that that is the thing that it's like Mm -hmm. don't abdicate that to people that you pay it's like you be creative for me i mean sure you can continue to enjoy great art but make it yourself in any shape or form that excites you follow your bliss in that way and even i'd say five to 15 minutes a day minimum at -hmm. least five to six days a week so if that just means in the morning you write nonsense for 10 minutes do that you'll be amazed like what it does for your life 
Mm. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I love the point that you said before, where you said there is resistance, but then overcoming that um, creates the meaning. Could you expand on that a little bit? Because I think that's a really important point, especially when a lot of people um, working with a guy at the moment who's um, really into, you know, just having the universe give him a sign. And um, I think there are elements where that's very powerful. But then I think your point is also very powerful as well, where when you're on the path and you are creating signs come to you as well. Oh yeah. It, you stir the pot and, or you till the soil and then more things can grow out of it. You have to get in there and till it, let things compost. And it's, it's, it can be messy at times, but what's not messy is your ability to show up. And I think there was a line about, they asked some writer, like, when does inspiration strike for you? Or how does that happen? He's like, it happens at 10 a.m. when I sit down and start typing. It's like, <laughs> I, some days it's crap, some days it's good, but I just show up every day. And that's yeah. how it works. You show up. Every single time, uh, there's the message in my head that gives me a million excuses, whether check the email or I have these tasks to do, or I could, I, I want to do all those things first, make another cup of coffee, or, oh, I should do the laundry. And you just have to fight through that. And you learn that that's going to happen every day, mm -hmm. every day. Uh, and I, I learned the hard way that I know that once I get into it, once I break through, it actually will feel quite good. Um, and not only that, it gets even better than that. It's like now the entire day has meaning because I did the thing that was actually really important to my soul. Mm -hmm. And everything else is gravy. And conversely, if I don't do that, it's a monkey on my back all day long. I'm constantly like, oh, I need to do that thing. Oh, but I'm going to do this other thing first. And at a certain point in the day, it's it's just gone. It's like, it's not, your your life force isn't there. You're really not good for much besides dinner and whatever else you have to wrap up. You can't really be creative. For me, I, mm -hmm. my creative life force seems to be in the mornings and midday. And certainly you can, you can make switches, but if, for, if I'm playing the long game, it's like putting bricks in a wall. You just need to put in a couple a day, lay a few yes. bricks, and that's good. You, be, you, get, you start building a house or something a lot faster than you think. You do not, in my mind, need to be saying, I do need to do an entire wall of this house every single day. It's like, that is not sustainable. Yeah, uh, yeah. So how you weave that into your life, I think, is with small bricks and consistency. Taking breaks, like not every day, but most days, you know. Um, and then you also, I think, just find that by having that level of expression of creativity, um, everything else has a little more perspective. Like the other problems in your life, you're like, well, I know it's really valuable to me and nourishing and important, and I'm doing that stuff. Mm. I don't, I mean, like I'm working on a record right now. And it's in a pretty difficult time period because I don't really understand where it's going. And um, I, there's a lot of unknown, but it's sort of early in the stages and it's going very slowly, but it's, I'm just keep chopping wood at it. I come out every, you know, I just keep hacking away, record a song, make some improvs. I know through my own experience, like it's building. I just can't see it yet. I need to be in service to its creation, which all that requires is me showing up and hacking away at it. And eventually it will start to take shape. Um, and after many, many years of this, you start to realize that it isn't so much about the end result anyway, because as soon as you finish something, it's almost a letdown. Cause then it's like, well, now what? Now mm. I have to start something else. <laughs> so enjoy the process because it's really, that's all there is, is the process. Um, so I have to, I just take the foot off the gas pedal a little bit and say, just, just enjoy the unknown, like, all right, I'll work on this. Um, hmm, I went, oh, that was, now what? You know, and some days they're highs and some days they're lows, but the thing I can be proud of is showing up. What mm. comes through is bigger than me. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's such a good point, isn't it? It's like, often to think of it like climbing up a mountain, you know, in the, in the first, first couple of days climbing up a mountain or whatever it is, you know, to use the analogy, you don't know what direction to climb up. There's like a million different paths starting on the ground. You're like, this one could be the right one. This could be the right one. And then that flow state kind of occurs, you know, a day or two up the mountain when you've been able to see, look down and go, I've actually come a fair distance. And now I know that this path is the path that's going to lead me up there. And I think that's, you know, it's still challenging. You're still waking up every day, but it's, it's created that meaning because 
you've gone through the all the unknown. You're like, okay, now I can see the top. Um, but then to your point as well, you get to the top and you're pumped for about three minutes and you're like, no, fucking hell, where's the next mountain? <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people who have told me like, artists you're like yeah i got to the top of a big hill or a big mountain and we i wasn't so into the view <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly thought this is what we wanted and we're like um actually let's go back down to that other spot <laughs> we we're at that was a pretty good spot yeah um yeah it's, it's usually not as glamorous as you think but whatever it is you know people chasing fame or money it, um, it really doesn't seem like you can really convince people that it's not the true nourishment until they see it for themselves. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Well, so how about we go to the Ram Dust album? Because I think that would have been such an incredible experience for you. Um, what was the lead up like? When did you start to ever think that that might be a wonderful or, or possible thing to do even. And then how did that eventuate? Because I've listened to that thing. This is, this is the uh, selfish part of the podcast guys. This is when I'm just interested in hearing uh, a opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he was just someone I admired for many years, like a lot of us and was a teacher from afar. Mm. And um, it's difficult to describe energetically how it happened, but I mean, on a, on a pedantic level, I just reached out and pitched this idea and it was good timing. And they didn't know, you know, if he'd be up for it or not with his health when I showed up, but he ended up being up for it and we worked together for a while and um, it just turned into a really magical, really magical project. And it, it, it was a really powerful year of my life. And then it's been, that was in 2019 when it came out, 2018 when I was recording it. Mm. And I've been out performing songs from that. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to hit a button while I'm playing live and Ram Dass just booms over these massive systems. And I feel like we're singing together in a way. So it wow. feels very alive to me, even though he passed away um, actually a few days after the final portion of it released. Wow. And it, became, it was his last recorded teachings that I'm aware of. Uh, and that was a, an unknown honor in itself. Mm. So I, it's, I mean, it's life-changing in many respects and it's still kind of unfolding in this really cool way. So it feels very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, even, you know, that first track and you hear him say trees, the, the way he says, you know, <laughs> trivial mundane, I mean, they're not trivial, they're not mundane, of course, but with just that resonance, you know, and then you look out the first time I listened to it, I was just doing a little meditation and um, I, I came out of it, you know, seven minute song, eight minute song, whatever it is. And I was just like looking outside and I was like, I've never looked at trees in the way that you can tell Ram Das had, had looked at them like that, you know, to, to say it with such meaning and powers. It's just such a wonderful, oh, it's just a, yeah, it's a brilliant album, mate. I can't thank you enough for it. And yeah, it's, it's certainly tapped into something in me for sure. <laughs> and a lot of people from the sounds of things, yeah, of course. That song, the nature song, was actually the first, that was the first thing he said. So, I mean, it's the first thing on the album and that's the first word he said. That's exactly what he said. I just kind of spaced it out into the music, but I was equally like curious and confused. Like, where's he going with this? You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then once he finished that first nature like bit, um talking about how you're, you know, you're seeing yourself and it's all one th i i just remember him then looking at me when he was done and he was like a mic drop and he was like oh damn yeah. this is gonna be really good <laughs> it's gonna be really good and we were just off to the races after that yeah. uh, he was a true master locked away a bit by the aphasia from his stroke but mm -hmm. inside the music he really came alive mm, yeah absolutely so you went over there and um, did you record for a couple of days or weeks? So how did that all, what was the process like? Yeah, I was there for a week. We recorded twice and then the other things were more social. And then I worked on it um, over the year, got some feedback here and there. And then I went back, I think three more times when he was still alive because they had, they had, were having these retreats in Maui's. So I was playing, performing at the retreats, mm. which were awesome and magical. And um, so I think it was like four trips over a couple of years in the, basically the last two, three years of his life. 
Yeah. Wow. And it is amazing that he, yeah, he passed. Um, what did you say? Days after the album was dropped or? Yeah. God, isn't that yeah the album came out in stages, but yeah, the final release was a, a series of reworks by some other amazing artists and it's called the reworks album. Yeah. And that came out in December uh, near Christmas and he died uh, around right around that time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, that was really interesting for me because I just started listening to that. And then, you know, I remember December or whatever it was, I think it was no, late November, perhaps um, in 2019 before the entire world changed. <laughs> right. Right. Probably would like him around still, <laughs> but yeah. I think he dodged the bullet in some ways. It's like, I kind <laughs> of, I kind of would like, I know he, he could meet any moment, but I don't want to see like, I didn't want him to have to go through that. Plus all like the woke revolution too. I, it's just almost better. Like his lifetime was complete in this perfect way for a, a, a time period. And what he chose to speak about, at least in, on our record and all of his teachings and books are very relevant to, mm-hmm. to today. Um, and he was very old and I think could tell it was hard for him in the last years. Physically is painful. And, um, It'd be hard for it'd be hard for anyone to go through. I guess I just have my own compassion for for him to like, man, I have to go through all that too. Um, so yeah, he he missed that. He missed that experience. Mm. Yeah, he, he certainly did. But yeah, he he did he did enough. God, he wrote a lot of books, and he you know his yeah, it was he was so wonderful, wasn't he? Just like the way his talks were, just there was always a bit of humor underlying his talks. Yeah, you know, I, I love him like Alan Watts as well, because whenever you feel like you're getting too lost in this, what is this enlightened process? You'll throw in something funny, like, oh, cool. Just a, just, just a dude. Yeah. That's what I liked about him. He's a recipe of humor, psychedelia, and deep intellectualism. Mm. And that trifecta, I think, is what really drew me to him and maybe a lot of people because it's very approachable and he's very, he was very charismatic. Super charismatic, yeah. 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 yeah yeah for sure man well mate what's um so you mentioned that you're working on an album now um where's your inspiration coming from these days without obviously giving too much away but yeah what are some what's in the next six months here? i don't know that's it's a, like i said it's a bit of a mess but this is normal yeah. um i'm working on a lot of things right now i mean i'm working on my own studio record that's uh in process and pretty early but i'm working on a lot of music for journey space that i mentioned those are long form ceremony pieces like four hours long and stuff to guide journeys so i'm basically when i play ceremonies in the real world i'm recording them and sometimes there's some magic there because they have to come from that improvised space for me whereas studio records are a little different they're more like i'm here in the studio and a lot of pianos and i've been working from kind of a sound design perspective and just trying to be more experimental with some of my approaches than what i've done in the past Mm. Also some interesting collaborations that are um, working with an artist named Miriam that I'm, I'm hoping some of that will end up on the album because it's just very different. Like I said, I'm recording some live drums, which is not something I've done a lot with East Forest, just a little bit. And that's a really interesting, very difficult challenge for me, but it's cool. You know, you start to bring groove in. Um, yeah, so I'll yeah. probably bring some, a bass player into, cause I think it can help a lot when you have live drums of bass, you have to, you know, bring in that groove mm-hmm. and, uh, I'm working on some, some other projects, which are really fun. Some other like, collaborative things. So it's, it's busy. It's always been busy and then touring a lot. Are you in Ireland? No, uh, Australia down in, in the Australia, South in Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, that's um, all right. I hope to get back out there, mm. um, in it might not be until February, yep. but we were talking about June, but then I saw recently things opened up there a bit. So it's been a very difficult guessing game to like when to pull the trigger to try. Cause I've been burned a few times, but yes. love Australia and have my first tour there right before COVID. Or I was right when it was starting. It was in February of 2020. Oh, shit. I remember flying back and like two people were wearing masks on the plane. I was like, look at those people. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, but I feel a real connection to the community there and I look forward to coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, we'd love, love to have you back, especially because, yeah, I think the, what COVID's done, I suppose, in a positive way, if you can see it like this is, you know, it's, it's ruined the, the, the live performance industry, which just absolutely sucks. But 
you're also seeing these bands put out these albums that they probably wouldn't have done because, you know, there's this touring going on. They're looking at things from different angles and like zoom collaborations and shit like that. So it's like the people that have adapted, especially in the music industry is um, they've, they've really shone through and, you know, we're all waiting to see them live, which is going to be really epic. You know, I had multiple collaborations that never would have happened if it wasn't for COVID because they would have been way too busy. And uh, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's been such a weird time. But um, yeah, the people that have adapted, I think, have like continued to create, you know, which I think is really cool. So yeah, for sure. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward to, I mean, we're getting back on the road now. And I think now I'm just trying to make sure it's not like too much. You know, I don't want to burn out, but there's a lot of, there's a lot coming up. Mm, yeah. And if there was ever a time to create music for inner journeys and, you know, God, if anything, especially in the past couple of days, you know, now, now is the time. So yeah, mate, thank you so much again for doing what you're doing. And, and, you know, even just from a, a simpler perspective, like just creating good tunes, good music. It's just so lovely to listen. We always, when Siobhan's drinking cacao or I'm having coffee, um, we just have it on in the background, just creates, oh, thanks, makes a more man. peaceful morning and it's really lovely. Yeah, I, I, well, I do appreciate you saying that because I think sometimes because I do have an intention with my music, sometimes people then, I don't know, they forget. I, I mean, at the end of the day for me, I like just, I just want to make good music, you know, and I'm really trying hard as an artist to push my own limits and I'm um, inspired by my contemporaries and all the things people are doing is such amazing things with music these days. Like, uh, that's my world too. And just because I'm trying, or I like to make deeply emotional music doesn't mean the fact that I, I just try to make good music. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know? So I, I put a lot of time into, you know, getting good sounds and, and experimenting and mastering and mixing and, you know. Yeah, yeah. And no, it's great. We, we absolutely love it. Um, well, so yeah, so where can, where can people find you, East, and, and things that are coming up? Um, yeah, run us through it. Um, I'm anywhere you listen to music, just East Forest and on social media. It's East Forest on Instagram and East Forest Music on the others. Yeah, eastforest.org is the site. And that's, I guess that's the easiest if you just want to see tour dates or get on the mailing list to learn about stuff like that. A journey space is journeyspace.com. And my podcast is called 10 Laws with East Forest. Mm. Oh, yeah. Tell us about your podcast just quickly. What's, um, what's kind of the groove with that? It's been, uh, we're just about to, I mean, whenever this comes out, we'll be at 200 episodes. It's been weekly yeah. and it's interview based, but every now and then I put out a meditation or occasionally some music mm. and there's a Patreon attached to it. So it's, it's basically ad free. It's just some people would support through the Patreon, which is wonderful. We have a monthly zoom council that we do on the Patreon, Oh, cool! but it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of like this. It's conversation based with creatives and, um, wellness folks scientists musicians uh provocateurs good Uh, good. (laughs) i I like it yeah it's it's as you know it's like an interesting uh, modality to like listen and and learn about people Mm, yeah it's it's just so good i just i I tell everyone that they should have their own podcast you know it's just (laughs) the fact that we can speak to people from all over the world now and it's just it's so great you know it's um and also i think you never know who's gonna say yeah let's do a show i think a lot of people aren't sure about emailing people reaching out and but people you know like-minded people love to talk and connect and you know what what a wonderful way to do that and you can you know you don't have to do interviews for mm. podcasts there's also so many different ways to go about it so uh, just figure out like what feels fun to you and sustainable and you can always give it a go. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah, it's been fun, man. It's been totally fun. So that's been that's been going on for a while, and it's got a nice little community. Yeah, that's great, man. Cool. Well, yeah, Ace, thank you so much for your time, mate. Once again, real honor because we, you know, we've really loved your music for a long time. So thank you so much for jumping on board. Oh, thank you. And, um, yeah, it's been fun. You're welcome. Cheers. Cool, guys. Thank you so much for listening. We'll we'll speak to you next week. All right. Bye.